Hello, everyone, and welcome to our book talk in medical humanities this evening. I'm Dr. Arden Hegley, lecturer in the discipline of English and comparative literature, and I'm the main organizer of our explorations in the medical humanities lecture series. Um, tonight, we're thrilled to be hosting Heather Davis and her new book, Plastic Matter, published earlier this year. Um, I'm delighted to launch the panel and look forward to a rich conversation. Um, but first, I wanted to say how grateful we are for the support of the Explorations in the Medical Humanities series at the Society of Fellows and Heyman Center for the Humanities, and also for the support of the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society and their program in medical humanities. Um, I'm also especially grateful to Helen Zhao, who is the Public Humanities Fellow in Medical Humanities, who did much behind the scenes to coordinate the event. Um, before I introduce our chair, I wanted to say a couple things about format. Um, we're both in person and on a webinar. After we hear from our speakers, we will have an option for including questions from the in-person audience. Um, I'd like to introduce now Dr. Leah Aronofsky, who will be moderating our discussion tonight and taking your questions. Dr. Aronofsky is a historian at Columbia University, where she's currently a fellow at the, the Society of Fellows. She received her PhD in history of science from Harvard University. Her book project is a history of the climate crisis told through the alternating lenses of the history of climate science, the history of climate governance, and the history of capitalism. In 2019, research for this project received the Rachel Carson Prize for the best dissertation in environmental history from the American Society for Environmental History. Dr. Aronofsky's academic writing has appeared in Critical Inquiry, environmental history and environmental humanities, as well as in places like the New York Review of Books, Public Books, and Jacobin. Welcome, Dr. Leah Aronofsky. Thank you, Arden, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, I have the great honor of introducing both our moderator and our speaker tonight, so I'll introduce them both, um, and then I will turn it over to Heather. Uh, so our moderator tonight is Jennifer Wenzel. Uh, she's a scholar of post-colonial studies and environmental and energy humanities here at Columbia. Um, and she's jointly appointed as a professor in the Department of English and Comparative Literature, as well as the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and uh, African Studies. She's also an affiliate here uh, at the Columbia Climate School. Her book, The Disposition of Nature, Environmental Crisis and World Literature, was shortlisted for the 2020 Book Prize awarded by the Association for the Study of the Arts of the Present, ASAP, and was a finalist for the Asley Ecocriticism Book Prize. Um, with Imre Zeman and Patricia Yeager, she co-edited Fueling Culture, 101 Words for Energy and Environment, which came out with Fordham University Press in 2017. And as a member of the After Oil Collective, she co-authored Celerities, Seeking Energy Justice which came out with Minnesota Forerunners in 2022. Her current research examines the fossil-fueled imagination in literature, in visual culture, and in public life. Uh, and Heather Davis is an assistant professor of culture and media at the New School here in New York. Uh, her work draws on feminist and queer theory to examine ecology, materiality, and contemporary art in the context of colonialism. Her most recent book, which we're all here to hear about tonight, Plastic Matter, explores the transformation of geology, media, and bodies in light of plastic saturation. Davis is a member of Synthetic Collective, an interdisciplinary team of scientists, humanities scholars, and artists who investigate and make visible plastic pollution in the Great Lakes. She was the co-curator of Plastic Entanglements, Ecology, Aesthetics, Materials, which was on view at the Palmer Museum of Art, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art, Smith College, and the Chazen Museum of Art from 2018 to 2020. Her writing has appeared in Eflux, Third Text, After All, Canadian Art, Philosophia, and Camera Obscura, and has been translated into Croatian, Slovak, Korean, French, and Chinese. She's the co-editor of Art in the Anthropocene, Encounters Among Aesthetics, Politics, Environments, and Epistemologies, and editor of the award-winning Desire Change, Contemporary Feminist Art in Canada. Davis's work has been supported through numerous fellowships, including a residency at the Grantham Foundation, a Mellon Visiting Scholar Fellowship at the University of Oregon, a Critical Studies Teaching Fellowship at the Cranbrook, Cranbrook Academy of Art, and a Mellon Postdoctoral Fellowship at Pennsylvania State University. And this year, she is a member of the School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. 
So we further all that further ado. Um, so yeah, thank you so, so much um, for the invitation. Also, thanks to Helen, Zhao, Arden, Jennifer, and Leah. It's really such a pleasure to be here and to be in conversation with you. Um, and just to also say uh, publicly that this was one of the nicest invitations I've ever gotten. You all have been so organized and um, welcoming and, you know, all of that. So I just, I really appreciate it. Um, I also want to um, acknowledge that uh, this talk is happening on uh, Lenape Hoking. Um, and with that land acknowledgement, um, I do it both to remind myself of my position here as an uninvited guest, um, but also um, to kind of invite folks to hold me accountable um, for anti-colonial ways of working and doing. Um, and uh, I realize this is just a very, very small, small gesture in that, um, in that direction. Um, so I thought that since um, since this was a medical humanities um, talk or field, uh, it, this is this is being hosted by that I would organize my questions or my thoughts and questions um, today around toxicity and pollution. Um, so just to sort of say that the book um, is very interdisciplinary in nature. I'm trained um, in cultural studies, which in some ways is kind of a non-discipline to begin with, um, but uh, but it really kind of brings together um, things from from uh, queer theory, critical race theory, um, and obviously environmental humanities and uh, science and technology studies to kind of look at kind of questions of uh, plastic. Um, and one of the things I also wanted to sort of say in relationship um, to this project with uh, which, I mean, Leah was actually one of the first people who read a very early um, draft of the book. Um, was that since I started this work about 10 years ago, um, there's obviously been more and more awareness that has grown around the proliferation of plastic with some extremely hopeful signs um, that things might actually change the sort of for, foremost of those things um, being the UN Environmental Assembly, um, which has pledged to forge an internationally legally binding agreement by the end of 2024 to quote end plastic pollution. Not quite sure what that means at this point, but uh, you know, it's it's nice for that to be a, a kind of on um, on the international stage in that way. Um, as a you know, when I started this project, like, there was just very little information kind of publicly circulating about um, plastic or plastic pollution. So, um, so it is a really different moment, I think, um, and I'm excited to see sort of what comes of it. But I also want to say simultaneously, oh, this work. It, this always happens. It like works the first time and then it doesn't work anymore. Um, um, but um, but just to sort of also say that um, to date, uh, plastic production has continued to increase. So while there are these increased kind of um, both international and national binding treaties and certain forms of plastic and certain forms of um, especially single use plastics that are circulating. For example, in the EU, there's the pledge to uh, reduce plastic packaging by 2025, which includes a, a 10 item ban of, you know, things like cotton buds, cutlery, straws, plastic cups, um, plastic bottles, coffee cups, takeaway containers, and cigarette filters. Um, and also to extend um, extend, uh, drastically expand extended producer responsibility bills. Um, there's still, all of this is still happening in a context where plastic is being used in ever larger quantities with an exponential increase over the last 60 years. So there really hasn't been any decrease in plastic production. And in fact, um, in lots of ways, when you look at the kind of portfolios of fossil fuel companies, which of course all of this has shifted since the beginning of the Ukraine war, but, but um, or the war in Ukraine, um, that um, that fossil fuel companies are really putting much like more and more of their kind of stock and energy into um, making plastics, right? This is another like as people are trying to turn towards a kind of green economy, one of the revenue streams that is predicted to increase is the is the revenue stream coming from 
um, the production of plastics. So um, right now, um, or as of a couple of years ago, it is um, plastics produced in astronomical amounts, about 380 million tons, uh, metric tons, globally per year, with about 9% recycled worldwide. But of course, um, I think I think at this point, it's also very widely known that recycling is um, <laughs> largely uh, an intensely kind of problematic um, uh, enterprise that that does very little to, as a kind of really um, efficacious tool of dealing with the kinds of qu questions of the amount of plastic that is circulating. Um, but it's still a good reminder that the remainder of the plastic waste, 91% of this huge amount of waste, um, is put into landfills, incinerated, or used for durable goods, um, such as the plastics found in building materials. Um, but obviously, a lot of this ends up in the wider environment, right? Because when you put something in a landfill, there's all kinds of ways in which um, leakage happens. Um, so if rates of plastic production continue with contemporary waste management practices, it is predicted that by 2050, 12 billion tons of plastic will be in landfills and throughout the water environment. Um, and it's really hard in some ways to fathom such a large number. And one of the things I kind of want to make clear here, um, even though I'm not in any way, shape, or form um, I'm, I'm a, a doctor or, you know, I'm not trained as a toxicologist, um, but, um, but that we really don't have a lot of understanding about what this actually means in terms of ecosystems and human health, right? Clearly there's like some very good indicators that things are going kind of wrong in, in a lot of areas, but this is, it's not as straightforward as it might, um, as it might appear. So what are the potential harms um, to humans from plastic? Um, hopefully this isn't too redundant for everybody, but um, but one one paper um, that was published about five years ago called for plastic to be considered toxic waste ow owing to the provable and probable negative health and environmental effects on many populations, including humans. And the reason for this, um, the scientists involved uh, wanted to make this kind of a move was because if it's toxic waste, then it has to be much more highly regulated than other kinds of materials. So it was really um, a strategic kind of decision but the authors in that paper highlight the fact that if plastic, um, oh, sorry, yeah, they, they highlight the fact that in plas the plastic were considered hazardous waste, there'd be more incentive to produce less hazardous polymer materials and existing materials would be handed more carefully. So the, they base their conclusions on a number of adverse health effects associated with plastics, including the fact that more than half of the chemical ingredients in plastics are hazardous and can be found to accumulate chemicals in the blood through, among other mechanisms of transfer medical supplies. So the study shows that even in cases where plastics are used to improve human health, and there's a lot of, um, obviously I think in the pandemic, we really saw this, that there was a kind of resurgence of the use of various types of single use plastics and a kind of justification for the use of single use plastics because of health and sanitary measures. Even in those cases, we are taking a certain amount of um, risk by, by uh, using those materials, um, including, in ways where um, the fact that microplastics can get into tissues and cells um, in all kinds of different ways, but in one of the, those mechanisms would, would be where a person's joints have been replaced with plastic. And this can disrupt cellular processes and degrade tissues. Um, there's also additional growing concern of, over the effect of associated additives, which are normally called plasticizers. And that can be like up to 80,000 different chemicals that are added to any particular plastic item that we come into contact with. Um, and the way in which things are regulated in the United States is that it's regulated on um, a you have to prove that something is harmful before it'll be taken off of the market rather than using a precautionary principle, which is what, in, which is what is used in the EU or in other places. Um, and part of the, also the additional problem of something like that is that you end up with um, what is called the cocktail effect, which is um, when, when all of these chemicals are actually interacting with our bodies in the real world, right? Like there's very little situations where we're just exposed to just one specific chemical that doesn't really exist outside of a lab situation. Um, and so there's all of these um, obviously um, well-known and well-documented um, effects on human health um, that that are very, um, that, that are, should cause some concern. Um, and then there's also the concern over the capacity of plastics to adsorb other toxic compounds, including DDT, pesticides, 
and polychlorinated biphenyls in waterways. So one of the problems is that because of all, because of the fact that all of these chemicals are petrochemicals, it means that they adhere to each other um, because of their oil-like substances. You can kind of imagine the same way in which if you put oil into a glass of water, it all tends to glom together. This is precisely what's happening um, with chemicals in our environment. So, and when that happens, it accumulates and then disperses these harmful chemicals with a lot of kind of unknown results. Um, so for example, in certain kinds of studies of, of different bird populations, in some studies, there seems to be a real uptake of those chemicals of the of DDT and uh, um, P PVCs and other, other types of um, forever chemicals into the bodies of the birds and in other studies that has been disproven. So, um, so I think that basically what all of this really says is that um, we don't really know what is happening with all of this, right? It's a kind of open-ended experiment with no control system. Um, and But we do obviously need to take the effects of the bodies um, uh, on all beings seriously with critical attention to the ways in which um, this plays out along the lines of race, class, geography, gender, and ability. So yeah, when it comes to plastic and its long-term effects in the environment, despite the growing body of scientific literature, there are many more questions than answers. But I do wanna point out that um, there's a couple of things that I think are, are very well known. Um, and one is that the toxicity of polymers containing chlorine and styrene um, and uh, any kind of plastics containing additives in the phthalate category is very well documented as a form of harm. Um, and although this has been documented for a very long time, for example, um, you know, it was discovered, uh, discovered, <laughs> it's kind of strange, like it was known, it came to, it came to be known in the, in the 1960s and 70s um, that, that styrene and chlorine based chemical, like specifically the production of PVC was incredibly toxic um, to workers who were developing angiosarcoma, which is a very rare type of cancer. Um, and, and those workers were developing that. And yet we still have PVC in all of these kinds of um, everyday objects that you see on the screen. So this is um, just an excerpt from Marina Zerkow's excellent petroleum manga, uh, which groups together um, objects from our everyday life by way of their chemical composition. So this is, um, I'm pretty sure that's the PVC one. Um, and then there's other there's other types of plastics such as um, polyethylene and polypropylene, which do not really suggest a lot of risk. Actually, um, aside from the fact of uh, the problem of their dispersion, the problem of the potential um, adsorption, um, and you know other kinds of problems associated with them. But in terms of like especially in terms of production and consumer health, um, there's there's uh, consumer health especially, there's very little risk associated with those particular uh, particular types of plastics. So, um, but one of the things that I wanted, that I focused on in the book um, is the question of plastic production and health. Um, because I think that we often understand plastics health effects from the point of view of consumers. I think that that's what um, that's what people are most attuned to. Um, and what I think that this serves to do is it serves to make plastic an individual problem, right? Which it certainly is not. It also serves to make kind of choices around um, consumer health, the kind of mechanism um, by way in which we mediate uh, health and toxicity in the world, uh, which of course is entirely inadequate. Um, so instead, I really wanted to kind of um, when I deal with questions of the sort of health effects of um, plastic pollution in the book, I mostly focus on the questions of the production side. Um, and that is precisely because um, that is really where uh, most of the health effects are concentrated, but also um, while it's necessary to contend with plastics dis dispersion, it's also important to recognize the ways in which it concentrates and tends to do so along lines that exacerbate racism and classism. So a lot of these factories are built um, in, uh, you know, low income or primarily um, communities of color and in North America that tends to be in indigenous, um, next to indigenous communities or next to black communities. Um, and I document this in the book, right? So. Um, and so, I mean, this is the same kind of story of environmental injustice that we see repeated um, from different kinds of, of um, vantage points. But I also wanna bring our attention to the ways in which that happens um, with plastic, because I think that plastic, especially the concerns around plastics 
toxicity and its relationship to health often really get promoted, even by some fairly well-known activist organizations as really this kind of matter of individual choice and, and selection and consumer selection, right? Um, and that's not really primarily where uh, I think some of the most concerning health effects or toxicity comes from. So one of the kind of more theoretical ways of framing this kind of question is, and oh, it's too bad you can't see the whole image there, but, uh, but that's, that's okay, the people on the internet can see it. Um, so this is um, a photograph of um, my grandmother. And the reason why it's in the book is because um, my grandfather was a chemical engineer at DuPont and later a manager um, for his entire life. And so one of the ways in which I tried to really frame the book was through this kind of question of inheritance um, and really thinking through my own intimacies with plastic um, and the ways in which it operates um, both as a kind of conceptual framework, but also as a framework um, for thinking through um, my own sort of implications with, with this material. And one of the reasons why I love this photograph is just because you can see um, you can see all of all of these things covered in plastic, right? So that not only is there all of the plastic objects, but then everything is also covered in plastic. And it, obviously it has this very kind of, you know, utopian 19, 1950s, 1960s um, kind of stylistic to it. So I think through the intimacies of plastic in part through my own direct inheritances of it and how inheritance in general provides a framework for thinking through the task of making worlds that always lie before us. So for philo philosopher Jacques Derrida, for example, inheritance is always in the making. Um, I use the word inheritance because it also refers to how structures of privilege and power are passed on. So in the book, I make a differentiation between um, inheritance that tends to kind of consolidate structures of privilege and transmission, um, which is more the, the kind of uh, the ways in which we are all exposed to plastics, whether we like it or not, or whether we're benefiting from its um, relationship in our life or not. Clearly, this is uh, not, <laughs> I, do, I don't mean this as like a, a um, uh, a binary that doesn't obviously have a lot of middle ground. Most of us, I think, um, kind of fall somewhere in between this relationship of inheritance and, tra and transmission. But just to draw attention to the fact that um, that plastic as a material really does do this work of shoring up privilege, right? It does do the work of consolidating a lot of the ways in which um, race and class in particular are already organized in the world. And then through the relationship of how the toxicity of it spreads through the relationship of who gets exposed to it and in what kinds of quantities and what types of chemicals people are exposed to, it does that kind of work of continuing to shore up inheritance or to shore, shore up um, structures of privilege and power. So part of the reason also why I was interested in the kind of conceptual framing of inheritance is that inheritance is still primarily used both legally and informally to speak of property relations. So inheritance is defined in the Oxford English Dictionary as the quote, succession to property, a title, office, et cetera, a coming into or taking possession of something as one's birthright, possession, ownership, or right of possession, right? Um, and I think that this inheritance as right, possession, and property really indicates how Western modernity conceives of intergenerational time. Um, and so to think about plastic within the kind of framework of um, Western um, in, intergenerational time, I think really helps to make the kind of ideological manifestations of what this materiality actually is a little bit more apparent. Um, so here we become the world with the world through our objects and inheritance as property rather than as skills or ways of being assumes a naturalized relation to capital and to colonial extraction and is about the ways in which filial relations, patriarchy and race unfold across generations, consolidating, as I've already said, rather than redistributing privilege. So as American studies scholar George Lipsitz writes, this kinds of inheritance works, quote, especially through intergenerational transfers of inherited wealth, the pass on the spoils of discrimination to succeeding generations. And one of the ways in which you can think about that maybe a little bit more concretely um, is both in the ways in which um, this, the, the position, the, the deliberate kind of positioning of petrochemical factories um, I, in low-income communities or in Black and primarily Indigenous communities um, 
that that exacerbates the kind of conditions of disposition under which those communities have already been struggling, right? So, um, so in some ways, this is the reason why somebody like Max LeBaron has defined um, plastic pollution as colonialism, um, very well known, I think, at this point, um, and in part because there's always there's always an assumed access to land, right? An assumed access to land in this part of the world, whether it be for extraction, for recycling, for waste management, for any of these things. There's a primarily an, an, a, an assumption that this is going to um, happen to begin with. And so um, the kind of production and, dis and dispersion of plastic also does the same kind of work of consolidating these, these, um, these pre-existing uh, structures of privilege. So in some ways, and another way um, to think through this um, would be thinking about plastic as a kind of infrastructure of whiteness or of white supremacy through things like the fantasy of self-enclosure, right? So um, plastic is obviously materialized as a sealant, a barrier, um, or a container. It embodies the Western desire to rid ourselves of our obligations, relations, and connections to the land. The ability of plastic to seal an object or a person off from the broader environment lends the material to an imaginary where technology can shield us from harm, from hazmat soups to Tupperware's ability to vigilantly protect vulnerable leftover food from all external threat. Plastic becomes the imagined barrier to protect from other forms of injury. And what is really ironic is that plastic is often used in situations where um, it's, being, it's being used to protect workers from other forms of petrochemical harm. So for example, on oil rigs, um, workers are uh, required to wear um, petrotextiles that are saturated in flame retardants and other petrochemically derived um, uh, compound in order to protect them from the oil that then they are that they are extracting out of the ground right so yeah exactly it's ridiculous um and um you know or in other situations you know there's uh, plastic is being used to um as kind of wide like white sheets that are being put over the alps um, in order to create a reflective surface so that the snow um, uh, and the glaciers melt at a, at a rate that is slower. So there's all of these ways in which um, there's this kind of very like negative and ironic kind of feedback loops um, that you see through the very particular manifestations of, um, of plastics kind of permuta permutation and, and movement in the world. But I think that all of this really points to um, the kind of, you know, fundamental sort of misunderstanding of materiality and toxicity that's sort of at the heart of all of these problems, um, which is um, this kind of border wall thinking, right, which is what um, Rachel Lee argues, which has separated um, warfare chemical exposure from everyday toxicity. Um, so here, obviously, you know, plastics um, were also obviously developed in the context of the Second World War, um, everything from, you know, Teflon to nylon being used as, as parachutes um, and are now kind of transferred to everyday domestic industrial um, chemical exposure. And it is a willful, missing, willful misunderstanding of the nature of chemical toxicants and the way that they permeate in ecosystems. So the fiction of the boundedness of the home environment um, or the boundedness of this figure in this hazmat suit um, and the supposed separation between public and private or the supposed kind of ability for one to be able to shore up privilege enough so that you actually aren't going to be affected by any of these things is a fundamental, it's a kind of imagined site of refuge from the burdens of the world, but has been repeatedly shown to be coextensive with rather than separate from the harms of our environments. So as Lee goes on to note, this border wall thinking, quote, offers a fiction of comfort for elite subjects of the global north, end quote. So there's a way in which um, this kind of, uh, this fantasy of self-enclosure is really at the heart of what plastic is and does in the world, um, and is obviously um, kind of fundamentally um, a misunderstanding of, of materiality. Um, so one of the, one of the other things I kind of wanted to, that's sort of, you know, the overview of, of the ways in which I've been sort of thinking through questions of toxicity and plastic pollution in the book. Um, but a couple other things I wanted to highlight um, was sort of methods, um, methodologies for approaching toxicity. So I'm just gonna go through three relatively briefly um, 
but just to kind of give you some sense of how I've been approaching these questions or how do we think about them um, within kind of frameworks of um, justice, but also within kinds of um, frameworks of, of thinking about how do we sort of just live with this, with this kind of permutation of this material. So one of the ways in which I've been doing this is through, or one of the chapters in particular deals with this kind of question of haunting. So this image here is, um, is taken from the series um, by Courtney Desiree Morris um, called Solastalgia. And it is an image of, uh, of her um, grandmother's um, home, not like, uh, like in, the, in the area of, um, from Moss Lake, um, Mossville, sorry, uh, Louisiana. And in Mossville, um, which is right next to West Lake, <laughs> um, that's another community that's affected by the petrochemical industry. Um, Mossville is famous for um, both being a real one of the first uh, towns that was uh, the settled by free black people in the south. And so since the 1700s, it's actually been a really vibrant space of black uh, survival and cultural life. Um, but recently, um, it's in the last 10 years, it has really been undermined through the kind of uh, rampant exposure of petrochemicals um, to the point where a few years ago, the company Sassel bought out or I basically asked residents to move um, because of the amount of toxicity that was in the air. And so what she's taking a photograph of here is this, this like act of dispossession, right? Um, this act of like literal kind of material dispossession. And so... Um, and so the ways in which I've been thinking about this has been um, through a kind of uh, a, a, a relationship to haunting, right? So like, what do we do with, with sites like this, right? Um, and one of, the, one of the reasons why haunting for me has been an, uh, an, a useful kind of methodological approach to sites like Mossville, um, or you can see that also in um, Rochester, New York, in relationship to the Kodak factories or in other kinds of places, um, is that it describes a temporality that is indeterminate and that it refuses progression. Um, and instead asks us to sit with what has been done, understanding that the harms committed are permanent and the lives taken cannot be returned. And I don't mean this like, I mean, I think sometimes this comes off as being like maybe the overly negative or like overly kind of situated within a kind of framework of, of harm. Um, and, and I do think that there's a risk to that. However, I also think that there's a way in which um, the ways in which we think about toxicity in a kind of... Um, like in a kind of broader cultural movement is really about containment, right? It's about all about the ability to be able to contain toxicity in different kinds of ways. And I think that what, what one of the things that, that really rapidly is so um, immediately obvious when you start looking at something like plastic is that it's completely and utterly uncontainable. Um, and, and so we have to think about different ways of relating to these kinds of chemical legacies that just can't be redeemed, right? Like there's just no way around that. There's no way around that. Um, there's obviously um, possibility for um, for different kinds of restoration, but um, but 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 things will never go back, right? There is no there is no possibility of return. And so the framework of haunting um, to me is is really useful in that sense because um, as Eve Tuck and C. Re have pointed out. They write, haunting doesn't hope to change people's perceptions, nor does it hope for reconciliation. Haunting lies precisely in its refusal to stop. Um, so this understanding of the ongoing and insistent legacies of plastic as an extension of, of the ecology of white supremacy functions precisely in its refusal, refusal to stop for the toxicities unearthed through plastic are not going away, which for me, like really kind of like lends itself in a more activist mode to being like, well, obviously the solution to this problem is to stop producing this in the first place, right? Like that there isn't, there isn't a way around that. There just isn't. Um, so one of the other ways in which I've been thinking through these questions is through a kind of framework of, of intimacy um, so that's the second kind of approach. So I'm driven by a methodological approach that values and privileges intimacy. So if in much critical thinking, there is a distance that is presumed and required in order to see clearly with plastic, no such um, distance is possible. So instead of thinking about this as a kind of methodological pitfall, I take it as an opportunity to ask what it might mean to get closer to difficult or problematic objects. 
So what might it mean to take these enmeshments, not as what we must distance ourselves from, instead by getting closer to objects, we may observe what lessons might be found. Um, so this is a methodological intimacy that hopes to stage a process of caretaking or making meaningful of objects and materials that are otherwise taken for granted, made invisible, or seemingly too big to think about, too abstract or alienated, which is like all of the problems of thinking with plastic. Um, so the Indian artist Tejal Shah's installation Between the Waves, um, which was done in 2012 as a, as a commission for Documenta, creates a world that blurs the boundaries between ancient systems and contemporary form when humans and artifacts, uh, plastic chief amongst them, are thoroughly enmeshed with non-humans. And what you're seeing here is uh, one screen from a kind of five, uh, five screen uh, video um, installation. So occupying a temporal register that is at once past, present, and future, the piece offers a mythic exploration of queer ecologies and a particularly poignant portrayal of a world saturated in plastic. Shaw invites their viewers placed in this mythic world to see plastic as agential and lively, but also as defying easy categorization. So much like in our own world, there is no escaping plastic in between the waves. So landfill dance, which is uh, with the still that you are seeing um, here on the screen, is one of the channels of Between the Waves and depicts what the title would suggest. Multiple femme performers dancing on top of a landfill in costumes equipped with improvised gas masks. The dancers' gestures come from ballet and contemporary dance, but also convey an intimacy and even aspects of care with the garbage that they are dancing on and crawling over, just as their bodies are nearly swallowed up by this giant pile of trash. In one instance, a dancer picks up a tiny ceramic jug, examining it and demonstrating an attentive curiosity for this putrid environment. So the video can be understood as an indictment of what we have made of the world, how it has been rendered toxic and uninhabitable, Importantly, though, I think it also asks us to move closer to the site of devastation. So instead of kind of like moving away from this, it's asking us to really pay attention to what is actually in the landfill um, and what could be made of it if we were to get closer to it um, and to become acquainted and invite creativity and movement. So this invitation to become more curious about plastic does not eschew the very real damage it's doing but it does ask us to learn to become more accountable and more enmeshed. And if that seems like very, very vague, like one of the ways in which um, I've been thinking about this sort of after the book that like it maybe gives a bit of, a, of an indication about how this might sort of be a practicable, um, practicable problem. I mean, with plastic, I haven't totally sorted this out, but, but, um, but well, the place that I grew up um, happens to be a, a place of, um, or there's only one industry in the town and that uh, that industry is the nuclear industry. And one of the things that's actually been very fascinating over the years is that town has been in, um, intensely petitioning the provincial government uh, to hold its own waste on the town site. So the waste coming from the new, those nuclear power plants, they've been asking the government to actually place the waste there because they feel like they can manage it better than other places. But I also think that this kind of stage is a really interesting kind of intervention into questions of, you know, nimbyism or um, the kind of ways in which there's always, um, toxicity is always being pushed to people who, who don't have the same kind of political power to be able to um, resist it. I think that this is like a kind of reversal of some of those, um, of some of those, those practices. And I think it would be really interesting to think through what that might mean um, in terms of other kinds of um, toxicities. So what would it mean if, if more privileged populations kind of intentionally um, took on the burden of toxicity more, right? Um, I'm not saying that this is good for anybody. Obviously, it's not. <laughs> but, but I do think the questions of distribution and and um, and who gets who gets exposed are vitally important to these kinds of questions. Um, and so, then the last way um, that I want to kind of um, gesture to as a kind of methodological orientation to questions of uh, toxicity in relationship to plastic pollution. Um, is through um, the kind of figure of queering. And they came at this through two different ways. One of them is, um, one of the ways in which this kind of showed up in the book for me was through the example of bacteria, bacteria and mycelium that can decompose plastic. So 
And these are some mealworms um, that have a particular kind of, that have evolved to, all evolved to have a particular kind of bacteria in their stomach, which means that um, we think they are successfully um, digesting styrofoam. So I kept them as household pets for a little while, which I don't necessarily recommend. It's not the same as like your happy, like worm composters with your vegetables. It's, it's not at all like that. They go through many life cycles, including, including like pupating and turning into beetles and then, you know, get like, then, then, and then having like eggs and then turning back into the worms. So like, if you're going to do this, just know, you should know this in advance, um, which I didn't really totally think through, I have to say before I did it. Um, but, uh, but in any case, um, I have been kind of like thinking about these beings um, as a kind of um, non-filial human pro progeny drawing on queer theory and its capacious kinship building. Um, and I do this both for, to account for the ways in which um, things like endocrine disrupting chemicals, so the kind of ca category of phthalates as, low, as well as other kinds of chemicals, including flame retardants, et cetera, um, are literally enacting a queering of the body. Um, so there's all kinds of ways in which species, lots of different species, but human bodies in particular, um, are becoming more morphologically um, less bifurcated because of the amount of um, because of the amount of, of petrochemicals that we have in our environment. Um, and to ask, like, what are the possibilities of something like that, right? To like, not, not just like say that this is some kind of redemptive strategy for the kind of violences that we have to endure through petrochemical saturation, but at the same time through this kind of approach that I think um, draws together the kind of questions of, of intimacy and the questions of haunting at the same time to really think through like, what is there that we might actually um, that might actually be um, politically interesting or useful, right? So like how might this kind of morphological queerness that is happening by way of endocrine disrupting chemicals actually offer different ways of being in the world that are potentially um, quite uh, generative. Um, so in uh, obviously, you know, for any of you who are familiar with Mel Chen's work, this, this kind of line of thinking is really indebted to the ways in which they've been thinking about um, toxicity and the potential kind of productive capacities of it um, through um, questions of race and gender. But I also want to show um, that this kind of um, yeah, so that there might be kind of one of the unexpected pleasures of the diffusion of plastic, obviously not in a redemptive mode, but in a thinking about kind of desire-based research, for example, um, as Eve Tuck has called it. Um, but also I should say that embracing the idea of plastic eating bacteria within a kind of family structure um, as a kind of kin is a deliberate move in the sense that it acknowledges that even though um, one might be tied to or have commitments to particular relations that we call families, either chosen families or um, biological families, um, that those places are not innocent, but are full of fraught tensions, right? Like, it's not like, it's just such a great thing that now, I, now I'm proposing that, that, that these mealworms are kind of a, a sort of non-filial human kin, right? Like, if we are really going to have to take care of them, that really, or if we're really going to have to think through our kind of, um, you know, responsibilities towards those kinds of beings, that's not necessarily like one that is full of pleasure and uh, and sort of easy harmony, right? Like just as with any kind of family structure, this is gonna be full of um, difficulties. So it's, but it is, I think, an invitation to understand. I, I, in, I think that, that the framework is still useful in the sense that I think it's an invitation to understand our connections and our commitments and the kinds of responsibilities that we cannot avoid. Um, so, um, so those are the kinds of three ways in which I've been thinking through the kind of methodological commitments to thinking about plastic and pollution and its toxicities. Um, obviously, there's a lot more detail to the arguments in the in the book, but I hope that kind of gives a little bit of an overview. Um, and I just wanted to say sort of in conclusion that what I hope to do overall with the book is to really follow plastic where it led. Um, including its toxic trails. So many of the ways in which things that kind of got picked up in the book were really just from sort of asking after what, what would it really mean to actually follow plastic where it goes in the world and, and how it's manifesting and what are the ways in which um, it's materializing, both in the sense of um, doing all of this work of consolidating uh, these kinds of human desires around questions of, of um, separation or separability or invulnerability, but also at the same time, the ways in which it's kind of constantly escaping us and there's no way in which we can actually 
control it. Um, so toxicity obviously is a condition that we cannot escape um, at this moment in time, but I also want to sort of remind us that this was never we've always lived with toxicity, right? <laughs> plants, plants, animals, and minerals have always been with us on this earth. And so toxicity itself is not something that we can avoid. But I think that this particular forms of petrochemical toxicity lend themselves to a particular kind of analysis that we have to account for um, that I hope uh, I hope is, um, is well argued for in the book. Um, but I also hope that in recognizing the ideologies behind plastics proliferation and in tracing some of its strange emergences, I hope that, that this condition is something that we can learn from. So I'm going to end there and happy to. So uh, that was incredibly rich, and I'm I'm struck um, by the um, just the the to me what is a really satisfying and and exciting combination of real attention to the material, right, uh, but also to the to the conceptual and and how they work together. So it, these are only half of my notes that you can see here, and so. I've, I've tried to boil down my, my thoughts um, to, to three questions or three kind of sets of observations for you. Um, and the one has to do with uh, temporality. And um, you started um, just by talking about, you know, the fact that in effect, we, we have yet to meet, meet, meet uh, to, to achieve peak plastic, right? Mm -hmm. the, the production just keeps going um, despite everything that we know. And so, you know, that raises questions for me of, of precisely why plastic persists. And I think I have more of an understanding of the answer to that question in chemical terms than I do in political terms. Um, and so as you're talking, I'm thinking about how to, how to think between a number of, of versions of temporality that you talked about. There's the, the complex relationship between inheritance and transmission as human modes of continuity. And then there's the, the, the other kind of persistence, which is um, the persistence of these substances in the environment and in, in uh, organisms. And so uh, the, the, the fact that plastic doesn't stop, right? In, in any sense, in terms of its production or, or its per persistence in the body. Um, and, and then you also talked about haunting and queering as other forms of, of persistence or changing over time. And so I wonder if you could talk a, a little bit more about those kind of human modes of, 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 of moving through time um, that we're accustomed to thinking about and, and these more material forms of persistence and how to think between them. So, uh, you know, um, you know, the, the work of the, um, the, a feminist uh, materialist Stacey Alimo has that idea of transcorporeality, the way that substances and ideas and power move across human bodies. And so it feels like what you're talking about is a kind of transgenerational transcorporeality, right? And so like, well, what, what does that mean? That, that's, you know, and, and, you know, as you're suggesting, you know, plastic itself is so paradoxical in its temporalities because it is both more and less stable than we think it is, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's sorry, that's one question. <laughs> um, the second question I think is not quite as involved. And, and I think you speak really powerfully about the imbrication of plastic um, with uh, inequity and unevenness. Um, and um, I'm intrigued by the idea that, that you draw out of desires for separation and protection and vulnerability that plastic is part of an infrastructure of white supremacy, um, which is really suggestive. And I, I wonder if it's only that, right? And I don't, I, don't, I don't think that I heard you say that it's only that, but I'm wondering about a, another way of thinking about it. And, and that is 
plastic as a kind of index of modernity, mm -hmm. which we can see either in uh, the graduate um, or <laughs> in uh, or in you know just an anecdote um, that I have from traveling in India um, a couple times in the 1990s, and the first time that I was there when you would buy you know something a little of something or, or more of something it would tend to be wrapped in um, organic materials like leaves or jute or paper, or burlap, et cetera. And in my later trips, and then when I've been there much more recently, the things that used to be, or clay, you know, um, all, all of those organic kinds of really, really ingenious um, kinds of containers had been replaced by plastic mm -hmm. and that that in turn has sparked its own kind of movement, right? So that's one of the examples I would give of, of plastic in its travels through the globe, mm -hmm. probably as part of projects of development and modernization, mm -hmm. becoming um, th this kind of index of modernity that also happens to be a uh, pretty useful, <laughs> right? Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear a little more about that. Um, and then the last thing has to do with what you were saying about intimacy, which I really um, was intrigued by as an alternative to the sublime, right? The, the kind of unknowable, unthinkable effects of all of this stuff that is with us forever, um, and you know the the sublime. If you've ever moved house and try to figure out what you're going to do with all the plastic bags and plastic containers, I mean, I, I have literally like stood in a kitchen and thought, "What do I do with this? What, what do I do with this?" And so I, I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that kind of scalar reorientation toward intimacy a, away from that that too bigness of the sublime. And I think that where you went with with queerness is a is a kind of parallel direction to something that I was thinking about um, Stephen Jackson's broken world thinking, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a, about kind of a, a, assuming a relationship of of maintenance and and repair. I don't know what it would mean exactly to maintain or, or repair plastic, and and I think that maybe my latter two questions, I'm cognizant of them being at the consumer end of plastics rather than the production end. Um, but these are just some of the things that, that you led me to think about for which I'm very grateful. Oh, well, thank you so much for those really rich, um, yeah, questions and comments. Um, we all go through them, let's see. Um, Maybe I'll start at the end and move up <laughs> backwards. Um, so parting, starting with, with um, intimacy as attentiveness or sort of as an alternative to the sublime. I mean, I think I was thinking about intimacy in part because, um, you know, one of the kind of, one of the impulses for starting the project uh, was really in the fact that I'm, you know, I'm really just kind of interested um, you know, like you, like other, like other scholars, in what what does what does it mean to live in a world that is so saturated in fossil fuels? And I think that um, for me, plastic is one of the ways that we really access that on a bodily level, on an everyday scale. Um, like I think that our relationship to fossil fuels um, more generally uh, is very abstracted, right? Like we understand that electricity or energy or um, you know other kinds of things, the ways in which our our, our you know highway structures are built, etc. That like you know all of these things are are built through kind of energy infrastructures that rely upon a fossil fuel, um, the 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 reliance upon wide scale availability of fossil fuels, but um, but I think that you know that is that is you know and I think this ties back to kind of questions of like how do we think about climate change right like one of the kinds of problems of it as many many people have commented on is the fact that it does feel so unwieldy right um, and I think maybe less. So every day that passes, um, but uh, it does have a much more kind of intimate um, relationship. But plastic is one of these things that like is actually really how we interact with fossil fuels in a, this kind of very intimate level, right? It's used like for ev everything, right? And it's like all kinds of things that we put on our bodies or in our bodies. Um, and so, um, 
And so I think that like that is part of the reason why I was kind of fascinated with kinds of questions of intimacy um, as a kind of mode into thinking about um, about plastics and also to kind of deal with the kinds of questions, the kind of scalar problem of both um, the kind of widespread dispersion of plastics, but also the fact that the real kind of temporal problem of plastics um, has to do with its kind of molecular stability, right? So like on a macro level, most plastics um, will degrade pretty rapidly. Like this is actually a huge problem in conservation. Um, if you go to like MoMA or other places, it's like, it's a really, I mean, it's the reason why the Eva Hess works are like never gonna be seen again. The ones that were just up at um, the Guggenheim because they're all completely disintegrating, right? Because the, those plastics are not stable. Plastic is not a stable material. So if you really want something to last for a really long time, in an object form, like you should make it out of clay or something, you know, like, like that will be a way better medium. But, and so I think that like all of this, to me, it's like the intimacy is a way of being able to deal with the kind of like differences of scale. Um, because I think that we have a sense um, that like that, that molecules do enter our bodies and we understand them through their kinds of effects, but that also at the same time, um, we can kind of think through the kinds of problems of dispersion of plastics, right? Because that's also something that we actually have. So in some ways, I think the kind of switch to, the, to a kind of intimacy, the scale of the intimate is in some sense trying to make this problem a more human scale problem um, or a more bodily um, scale problem. <clears throat> which really kind of like, I think goes back to, you know, what you were pointing out about, about thinking about this as a kind of transgenerational, transcorporeal reality. Um, and I mean, I think that you're totally right. That's a great, <laughs> that's a great, that's a great way of, of putting it. And I certainly draw on um, Stacey Limo's work um, in the book. Um, and I mean, I think that this is one of the, one of the things about plastic as well, I mean, which I think we also confront when we confront kind of anything to do with fossil fuels is that is that you automatically are kind of entering into the space where there's a kind of multiple temporal collisions happening simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, one of the weird things about um, various kinds of plastic toxicity, for example, is that some in some forms of chemical exposure, the harm won't show up for two or three generations later. So, um, so you end up with these very strange kind of temporalities, right? Um, because of just the ways in which the chemicals themselves circulate in the world, um, which do, I think, um, in the kind of best case version of, of how to approach that would be something like, well, then we really have to be accountable for multiple generations in the future. And we really have to think this through in a really kind of like considered way. Um, and in obviously the ways in which it actually appears in the world is in, um, is in a much more kind of uh, like chaotic sense. So, so we're both dealing with the kinds of questions of deep time of where the fossil fuels come from to begin with. And we're also dealing with the questions of the kind of unknown futurities of plastic. Um, you know, the fact that there's like all of these um, organisms that can successfully metabolize plastics in various kinds of ways, that's happening much faster than I think anybody had any idea that it was going to, right? And there's also significant evidence that under particular kinds of solar um, um, and wind uh, movements of various kinds of plastics in the sea that they're also breaking down to the molecular parts. So, you know, there, there is, there are ways in which plastic is actually disintegrating or, or becoming um, something else much, much faster than we had originally anticipated. So, you know, the kinds of numbers around plastic and it's, um, you know, going to last forever or whatever is, is, is not really true. Um, what is true is that it, it, in, it is, um, entering into a kind of cycle of temporalities that are really unknown um, and that have have very kind of conflicting um, relationships with um, yeah questions of of inequity questions of um, the persistence of particular kinds of biological organisms you know like all of, all of that stuff because there really is so many kind of like lags or um, dispersion models or um, 
you know, all of these different conditions, because at the same time as plastics are breaking down much faster than we ever anticipated, they're also, you know, one of the, one of the um, objects that I take up in the book is the plastiglomerate, which is like a, a rock-like substance, right? <laughs> so, and, and that, it like, that looks like it's going to persist for a very, very long time. So, um, so, you know, plastic on the one hand sort of has the temporality of geology, and on the other hand has the temporality of like rapid evolution. And, and also, you know, because of its associated chemicals, harms will be felt three generations into the future. And at the same time, you know, there's immediate kind of harms to the body. So, so there's just like, there's just so many different, um, I think that like one of the things that, that has been both fascinating and difficult sort of to deal with is that kind of colliding sense of, um, of temporalities. Um, I, I hope that that kind of answers that question. Um, and yeah, the, the, the second about the sort of index of modernity, you're completely right. I mean, like one of the things that I was thinking about when you were, when you were talking about um, the, the kind of question in, in India um, is, I mean, this was sort of at the beginning of, of the building of plastics, but like one of the anecdotes that I came back across in, in archival research around plastic was the fact that um, when plastics, when plastic production was first happening in um, in Wilmington, Delaware, there, when people came into the valley, there was this kind of overwhelming stench, right? And I mean, I kind of think about this, like you know, I I've been because I've been um, commuting to Princeton. There's also like this section on the highway where there's a bunch of fossil fuel, some kind of petrochemical factory. I don't actually know what it is, but if anybody wants to chat with me afterwards, I'd really like to know. <laughs> um, but like, but, um, but, and it's the same, but at the time people didn't, like people actually, like literally everybody in the town, apparently, at least according to this one kind of oral history, really thought of it as the smell of success, uh -huh. right? And it's the same way in which like, and so people were really like, they were really, they really embraced it, you know? And I think that like, this also is a way in which, you know, like when you look at histories of New York City, for example, like the city was disgusting, you know, like a hundred years ago. And yet people still thought of it as a kind of like the hub of, of modernity or the hub of, of, of a kind of metropolitan existence. Same thing with London, right? So I think that you're right. I think this kind of relationship between pollution and modernity is actually incredibly deep um, and, um, and has a very long, long history. Um, so yes, I totally, I totally agree. And of course now this has been exported all over the world, yeah. Thank you, Heather. I'm gonna open it up to questions in the room now. And if you'll please wait until we pass the microphone to you. Thank you so much for that really wonderful talk. And thank you so much for the wonderful comments. Um, I'm really provoked by this injunction to get close to the objects we abjure. And I'd like you to maybe say more about how that asks us to reimagine harm. Um, so maybe you've seen Cronenberg's new movie, Crimes of the Future. I think that there Cronenberg is trying to give an answer to this question, but he doesn't quite succeed in escaping from this border wall thinking, right? So for him, the um, possibilities are only dystopian and perverse. Um, inviting harm is uh, inviting self-harm, self-injury of a kind that looks like uh, surgery one takes sexual pleasure in. So that's one sort of answer to, to this question, but I'm very curious what what sort of answer you are more interested in giving? Yeah, that's a great, um, that's a great example. And I was very uh, excited to go see that film and have lots of thoughts about it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think well, one of the other things that's really indicative of that film, I mean, his filmmaking in general, but, but even though I do also really love it and <laughs> love the kind of perverse horror of it, um, but, uh, but it's also so deeply patriarchal, right? Like just uh, kind of so obvious and, and, um, you know, there's such like totally gratuitous, ridiculous kind of patriarchy just kind of on display for a kind of male, like a, an unadulterated male gaze, right? And, and, uh, 
And so certainly that is that's not the direction that I would that I would like to go in. I mean, I think that um, I think that for me, it's it, in some ways that invitation is really a reaction against what I see happening in a kind of mainstream liberal framework, right? Which is that in a kind of mainstream liberal framework, the answer to toxicity is always about containment. Like so, for example, um, and it's always about containment for certain bodies, right? For certain people, for certain places for certain kinds of organisms, right? There's always an, uh, there's always a kind of hierarchy that's inbuilt into understanding what containment might mean and for whom is leakage okay and for whom it isn't, right? Um, and, you know, just as a kind of like concrete example of that, you know, in the Gowanus Canal, right, which is the super fun site um, that's, that, you know, right now the EPA is trying to actually go in and like dredge up all the sludge from the bottom of the canal and then seal it off. And I don't know where they're putting the sludge, they're putting it somewhere. Um, again, if somebody knows, <laughs> I would love to, I would love to know that information. Um, and, and of course they're doing this in order to be able to increase the real estate value around the Gowanus Canal and like put up like really high-end condos so that obviously, because obviously we don't have enough of them. Um, and, and one of the, you know, one of the interesting things is like, you know, um, a researcher at um, NYU, Elizabeth Hanaf, has been studying the bacteria in the Gowanus Canal and has actually shown that there's like a lot of ways in which the bacteria are already starting to eat a lot of the toxic sludge that's there. And one of the real effects that's going to happen when you start to dig up that toxic sludge is all of a sudden, like it's one, th it's, you know, it's not, it's obviously not great that it's there. Right? Like, I'm not trying to say that any of this is great that it's there, but it's like, now it's here, right? And it's going to be here for this kind of very unknown time into the future with very kind of unknown effects on our bodies. And so what is a kind of, for me, the question is then how do we deal with that at, 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 through a kind of like ethical lens, right? How do we deal with the ethics of that? Um, and, and, for me, you know, dredging that, like, for me, I think it's much more interesting to kind of leave it and to be like, well, what would happen if, if those bacteria just kind of slowly, eventually kind of made their way through or not, right? But that we had to actually, in some ways, just, just live with it, um, as opposed to the kind of phenomenon of waste management, especially in a place like the United States, where it's always being put on somebody else right? It's always being put somewhere else. And there's, um, and so it's not like, in some ways, it, it's not like I totally have an answer about like, what happens when we get closer to these things. But it's, but it is, it is a, a refusal of that kind of liberal logic of dispossession that has been really the status quo for like, at least 100 years in terms of waste management solutions within the context of North America. Yeah, thank you all for this wonderful conversation. Um, I was so fascinated by the laying out of the three frameworks and methods. And you mean them sort of as conceptual methods, um, but I'm also very struck that the third came with an actual experimental method, <laughs> um, which is to say one you don't recommend, but one that nonetheless you undertook as part of the project. So I'm curious if you've either imagined, enacted, uh, or either the individual level, or maybe again, the production scale, um, more experimental methods for the other two. Is there a kind of embodied or material method that we can enact for that intimacy? Is it sifting through landfills? Is it looking at that trash? Is there an experimental method for haunting? Is it visiting these sites? What might those look like um, as practices as well as conceptual moves? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I certainly like I teach a class on plastic and like one of the first things that I make the students do is like do plastic diaries and also like just like keep their waste <laughs> for you know like a month and just sort of see what it actually is it's like I just want I just want to like I just want to know like well so what what is actually there and I think that um that is a way of enacting that kind of methodological intimacy of like really thinking about these things I mean I saw this play once um it's like one of the anecdotes at the end of the book um but it really struck me because even though it was like, again, within an artistic framework rather than than in the kind of framework of, of um, you know, humanities or social science research or, or within the kind of framework of, of, you know, waste management policy or something, I thought it was really provocative because basically what it was was um, this artist, this theater performer who had collected her waste 
for an entire year. And then every night when she performs this play, she um, draws out all of these pieces of waste and then tells stories about them. And so at this point, she's like, she says in the, in the theater production that she's so attached to all of these different kinds of like waste. Like it's like, it's literally, it's just garbage, right? Like she's just drawing out all this garbage, but she, but she like, but she talks about like how it then becomes these mimetic devices. And that actually like that in, that she remembers that year of her life better than any other year of her life through her, the accumulation and the retelling of, of her own waste. And I think that that is, really like that to me is very fascinating as a kind of um as a maybe a gesture towards the kinds of things that you're talking about yeah but that's an excellent question I'll think more about it could I jump in on that question yeah really quickly I'm I'm reminded I'm trying to reconstruct the details you know Adam Dickinson the poet who wrote this um, collection of poems the polymers and in terms of your question about method um he creates a poetics out of the the chemical structures of petrochemicals but what he also did and I can't remember exactly how it inflects the poetics is he had his own tissue mm -hmm. tested for exposure to these substances and so his own body and his knowledge about the ways mm -hmm. in which plastic flows through him becomes part of the work he's doing in the book I'm not sure I recommend that as a method <laughs> Um, but but it, it surely is an example of of you know thinking uh, between the, the body and 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 the creation. Um, yeah, that's an excellent example. Yeah. Um, I'll jump in with maybe one final question. Um, I it was such a pleasure to read this book for a million reasons. Um, not least because I read this many years ago. And so it was this like unusual experience of like a vivid memory of where I was at in my life when I read it. And now what well, is like five years later, like it's just such an index of, of experience. And so I was thinking about you too, and like how the world has changed and how your life has changed, uh, like from the start to the finish of the book. And I'm sort of curious how you've sort of evolved in your thinking about plastic since the world has changed. But my question is more about um, um, it's actually about teaching and um, sort of gets back to a question that was asked earlier, but um, I was thinking a lot about ambivalence during, while I was reading it. And that really, you really, you're really weaving, threading a needle that I think captures um, a lot of a, a more general sentiment about the, the sort of desires that we have for theory to help us understand this world better, but also the limits of that, right? Like queering and sort of wanting to still hold space for the political, that kind of thing. And so I was, I really felt that ambivalence coming through and I think that's a real feat. Um, there's an assignment that I teach that is uh, a version of a, an assignment that I know Jennifer teaches, which is about, um, which is the oil inventory. And mm -hmm. it sounds like you have an, a similar assignment where you ask your students, just like keep a diary of, of like, all of your encounters with oil, including plastics for a day, a week, whatever. And I know Jennifer has struggled with this because I've read about, she's written about it, but, and I struggle with this too, sort of like, what is the sort of takeaway of that assignment mm -hmm. beyond, beyond sort of like ambivalence or, or I, it's an open question. I'm curious what you, what you hope students take away from that. And like thinking about teaching this idea of ambivalence to students and sort of helping them sit with the contradictions of their daily lives and sort of the like, on the one hand, wanting to, not wanting to uh, sort of break their hearts when you tell them that like, it's about more than just switching to a bamboo toothbrush or something like that. But at the same time, like wanting them to appreciate the sort of systems thinking and, um, and that all in the back, in addition, like the background of like plastics and saving lives, that kind of so, mm -hmm. so like ambivalence to me always feels like the best I can do with that assignment. <laughs> and I mean, that, that's not a bad thing, but anyway, I'm curious what, how you approach that kind of thinking with students. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, I teach also another course on like basically like art and climate change. And that one I think is like even more devastating mm -hmm. just because I think that like, 
it's one thing to talk about plastic and plastic pollution. It's not like it's it's not like things are great, but it doesn't feel quite as like imminently dire. Um, so I would imagine, obviously, in in the kind of oil version, maybe this goes to like darker places more quickly, um, but or more existential places more quickly. But I mean, I think that I think that you're right. I think ambivalence to me is actually something that I I really do want students to take away from um, classes, in part because I think that. I think that one of the things that is deeply necessary for the world that we currently live in is to be able to sit with like really deep contradiction, you know, I mean, especially because we are living, we, you know, you can't clean this up. It's not going to happen. Like there is no way to clean up plastic pollution, but it's just not possible. So, so, you know, just in the same way that it's not possible to, well, actually, I was going to say something that I realized it wasn't true. I was, I was going to be like, just as it's not possible to pull the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, I was like, of course, that's actually happening in lots of different places. But um, that's a whole other conversation. Um, but, but, um, but, but, yeah, the, I mean, the kind of rampant proliferation of of the kind of saturation of petrochemicals all throughout our world systems. That is something that we can't we can't reverse, right? So I think that. I think that being able to deal with that without while still maintaining a certain amount of curiosity or while still maintaining a certain amount of an ability to just kind of live with that or an ability to still want to act in particular ways, um, despite or with that knowledge, I think is something that's actually very important. And it's like, and I I, you know, obviously really, really appreciate. Um, all of the kind of very concrete um, actions that folks do in order to make this situation better. And, you know, I also um, talk to my students about all of those kinds of things. And then in, in particular in the plastics class, I get a lot of design students and that's actually very exciting for me because, um, you know, like one of the things I've been trying to figure out with one of the, one of the members of the synthetic collective, what we work together really closely um, is like how to create like, just like a poster that tells people why recycling is such a problem, like in just in a visual, like a really immediate visual design kind of thing. And like the next time I teach the plastic class, I'm going to make this an assignment to my students, you know, because, because it's like, I want, you know, we do other things like go to the Sims um, sorting facility and it's like, you know, like we, you know, we do all kinds of, you know, we, that that's where the um, mealworms came from in the first place was from that class. And so there's, <laughs> there's like, there's, I think there's like lots of different ways that we interact with plastic over the course of the semester, which I think like helps to give like maybe a bit more nuance or shape, um, to different types of possible responses. But one of the things that I really try to emphasize is the necessity for collective mm -hmm. action, um, but I think the pitfall of, of activist discourse, which is obviously strategic and important, um, is that sometimes a lot of the nuance of things can't be discussed in those kinds of frameworks um, for, you know, very good reasons. But, um, but I think that the advantage of something like theory or artwork is that there is an ability to both kind of, you know, both hold, hold kind of like devastation alongside um something that looks for solutions alongside just the total weirdness of the world you know <laughs> um and I think that that is like a space that I am often kind of in in my thinking um I hope you'll all join me in the final round of applause thank you so much for the